to the end where we will try to see how these insights can help us. So thinking about thinking. So we are at this, what is thinking? At the first level, we can say that thinking is acting at the level of thoughts. It says there is a physical level of reality. There is a mental level of reality. So we could say that if we look at the inferior vertex, I'll give some sense of why we are adopting this model a little later. But let's consider this simple model that there is a three level reality, body, mind and consciousness. So this is similar to a computer system or a phone where you have the hardware, the software and the user. So now the software is like the mind, the hardware is the body and the user is the consciousness. So when we talk about the word, even the word thought, which can transform into thinking, the word thought, we use it in two different senses. I just had a thought. I have given this a lot of thought. So when you've made this point that when I just had a thought, it's something to pop up within me. And I have given this a lot of thought means I have analyzed this. So we could put these two senses of thought together using the same phone metaphor. Say on our phone, some notification pops up. That's like a thought popping up within us. Now, not every notification needs to be noticed. <laughs> In fact, if we start noticing every notification, we will be overwhelmed. So similarly, not every thought needs to be known. Not Every thought needs to be thought. <laughs> so, right now, you are sitting here and some of you may be feeling slightly cold. Some of you may be feeling uncomfortable sitting on the floor. Some of you may be feeling hungry for tacos. <laughs> <laughs> now, if we see, simultaneously, there are so many thoughts popping up with it. And if we are to do anything constructive, we need to focus on certain things. So thoughts, so thoughts can have these two senses, something that just pops up within us and something that we give our attention to. So thinking about thinking, that is our topic today. So what it means is that we, when the many thoughts pop up within us, which thought do we give attention to? That's thinking about thinking. So in general, what is thinking? Thinking can either refer to just the thoughts popping up and we just passively observing them and getting carried away by them. Or thinking can also refer to our consciously focusing on a particular thought and analyzing it. It's both senses in which say you are using your phone. Now you could use your phone to maybe have a serious conversation with a friend or read some serious book or do something worthwhile. Or you could use your phone to just get distracted. One Facebook notification, another Facebook notification, one WhatsApp message and this and that. And so one YouTube video, next YouTube video. <laughs> <laughs> they could just be mindlessly surfing. So in both cases, we are engaged with the phone screen. But it's not the same in both cases. In one case, it's productive. In another case, it's, it's just distracting. It's unproductive at best. Sometimes it can be even counterproductive. So in that sense, thinking about thinking means analyzing how we are engaging with our thoughts. It's like, how am I using my phone? Am I using it constructively or am I using it destructively? So to be able to do this thinking, Let's consider another question. Are our thoughts powerful or are our thoughts powerless? How many of you feel powerful? Power. Okay. 
How many of you feel our thoughts are powerless? No one. Okay, let me ask you a question. Suppose you see someone sitting away, sitting late at night, peering out of a window, he's still sleeping, he was friend or family member. What are you thinking? So I'm, I'm thinking whether the sun should rise tomorrow or not. <laughs> the sun is going to rise whether you think about it or not. What is the use of such a thought? So you see, many of our thoughts are not like this. They are of things over which we have little or no control. I mean, who will win this baseball match, or who will win this basketball match, or even who will win the elections of this country or in this state or whatever. You have little or no control. So thoughts, are they powerful or are they powerless? Now, in one sense, this example I gave, this thought is powerless in the sense that it is not going to change the outer reality. Whether I think about However, I think about the situation around me, sun should rise or not, my thought is not going to change that. So in terms of influencing the outer world, that thought, that particular thought is powerless. Having said that, what about its capacity to influence us? Every thought that we have, does it have power to influence us? Yes, it has. A more precise one would be it has the potential to influence us powerfully. But it is important to understand that the thought has no power till we give it thought. A thought has no power till we give it thought. That means that notification, it can't change anything on my phone unless I click it. So, at one level, we do need to recognize the power of thoughts. I'll talk about that aspect soon. But uh, let's begin first with this understanding that thoughts are simply like notifications. And in themselves, many thoughts, or we could say even most thoughts, have no power. And they get their power to the extent we give them our thought, our attention. So for understanding this, we can envision thoughts to be like, say notifications can come broadly in two ways. Many ways, but broadly we could say. Notification can come as a, as a text. As a text. Your phone, your friend has updated their post, Facebook profile photo. Mm -hmm. That's a notification. Come as a text. Sometimes it can come as a sound or an image. So if it's a text, it's a sound. The phone beeps. Oh, what's happening? Okay, some message has come or something is happening. Or it can come as an image. You see something. Now we could say about three ways: text, sound, or image. And it depends on. So similarly, within us, our thoughts they may pop up. For most of us, the thoughts may pop up as, depending on the kind of prominent thinkers we are. Some of us are verbal thinkers, some of us are visual thinkers, some of us are more let's say, sonic thinkers. So, verbal thinkers means we could envision thought as a string of characters on your email screen, on your mind. Or it could be an image. Or it could be a like a radio, a voice in your head, a voice inside speaking something. But none of these can affect you. I would say not none of these, I would say most of these. But because some notifications may be about something that is about to happen. Your phone is going to restart now. That's something which is going to happen. But if you consider most of the notifications are not about, are more something which we need to act on for things to happen. Mm -hmm. So similarly, most of our thoughts are just pop-ups on our inner screen. 
to get a further sense of this, uh, let's consider a thought exercise. So wherever you are, you can sit comfortably and then you can close your eyes. After closing your eyes, you can take three deep breaths. One. Now, your eyes closed, look ahead in front of you and notice what you see in front. Because your eyes are closed, you can't see what is physically in front of you. And yet, there is some kind of screen inside you, on which you see various things. So that screen, when you are noticing it, on that screen you might see this room, you might see your, your home where you stay, you might see a friend, you might see your phone, you might see your college, you might see various things, images coming and going on that inner screen. Or you might see just a dull haze of colors over there. Whatever it is that you see, you see on a screen inside you. Now while you are looking at that screen, try to take a step back and catch sight of the person who is observing the screen. I repeat, while looking at the inner screen, step back to catch sight of the inner seer of that screen. Try once again. Step back and see the seer. No matter how much you step back, the seer steps back with you. What you are looking for is what you are looking with. So that inner seer is you, the consciousness. And that inner screen is your mind. You can take one deep breath and then you can open your eyes slowly. So when normal perception happens, so right now you are looking at me, I am looking at you. When this happens, three things need to be aligned. The inner seer, the inner screen and the outer sea. So if you are a part of the outer sea for me, I am the outer sea for you. And you are looking at me, I am looking at you. So when this happens, it is when the inner Screen is is focused on the outer sea. That's when you perceive things properly. But say on the inner screen, some other notification pops up, some other idea pops up, some other thought pops up. Say you are hearing this talk, and then suddenly the thought pops up. Did I lock my room when I came? Oh, I didn't. Maybe I did. What if somebody robs? I don't remember what happened. I keep thinking, what did I do? Did I lock it? Then that one thought pops up, and then that inner screen goes to that incident, and that particular thing happens. And then you may be physically here, but you are as good as not here. So essentially, when we are thinking, so we are the inner seer. The Bhagavad Gita, I talk about this three level reality, body, mind, and consciousness. The Bhagavad Gita says that we are meant to be seen. We are meant to be aware of our position as consciousness. We are not the physical reality around us. We are also not the thoughts that we think. We are the thinker of our thoughts. And thinker means we sit behind and we observe our thoughts. So now, based on observation, we can choose which thoughts to focus on. So most of the time, there are broadly two possibilities. When we are thinking, now here I am thinking in the sense that what are we in investing our consciousness in focusing on? We may be caught in the physical reality. The 
consciousness is here, the mind is here, the physical reality is here. So now, say if you are driving through a crowded road, then who is coming from where, who is in which plane, as you are observing that, your, your thoughts are completely caught in the physical reality. That's when we are, we are, we are focused on the outer world. There are some times when we say we are lost in thought. That means we are caught in the mental reality. Now that could be two ways. One is that you are consciously thinking seriously about some subject, and that's how. So we are, that's we are giving. Uh, I am giving this a lot of thought. So we are giving something serious thought. The other is we just get lost in thought without being aware. Sometimes we can concentrate and get absorbed in something, think of something, and sometimes I get distracted and get lost in something. But when we think, we will be thinking about the physical reality and our consciousness will be caught in that, whatever is happening at the physical level. Or we may be at the mental level and we may get caught in that. However, thinking is not so simple in the sense that most of the times our thinking is a combination of some stimulus at the physical level and some stimulus at the mental level. That means that each one of us, say sometimes the same thing happens and different people react very differently to it. Say somebody snubs us. Say three people are similarly snub. One person may say, this fool, this rude girl, in public in front of everyone and goes now. And they get lost in revenge fantasies, burning. Second person says, people are terrible. There was one philosopher who asked that, do you believe, he was an atheist, so he was asked, do you believe in hell? So he said, of course. What do you mean? Well, if, you, if you are an atheist, how do you believe in hell? Hell means other people. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, had such, such negative experiences with people probably, right? It's burnt. So, somebody might, one person might snub and, and some other he might, somebody might snub. People are terrible. People are terrible. I saw one car holding, he said, the more I get to know people, the more I love my dog. <laughs> so that's one possibility. We, so one is that we take this first is that we cultivate revenge fantasies about that person. Second is just dismiss all of humanity. People are dead. The third is that we may think I'm worthless. Nobody cares. Everybody walks over, everybody meets me. I am nobody. And if you see in each of these things, the incident is the same, but the experience is very different. And then at the physical level, what happened is the same. But the, the event at the physical level has stimulated thoughts in different ways. So when we start thinking, it's a combination of what happens at the physical level and what happens at the mental level. So depending on what we could say broadly our impressions are, what is stored in our mind from the past, from the way we have experienced life, that will get triggered. And that's how each one of us will perceive things differently. Say, if in each of us has a phone and each of us has some data in the phone. Now, if I search for some word, fool, maybe I have some cartoon images of people who are like fools, or maybe I have some article about it. Now, if I search on my phone for the word fool, I might find some things. 
If you search for the word fool on your phone, you may find something entirely different. You will probably find something quite different. And somebody else searches for the word fool, find something different. So now the, the word, the fool that is being typed at the physical level is the same for everyone. But what is there in the phone is different. So similarly for all of us, we may experience the same thing physically in the physical level. Now the data in the phone is stored at the mental level. Similarly, there are various impressions stored at the mental level. And the same thought, the same physical perception may trigger different thoughts for each one of us. And I talk about all these three, these three could be just all three could be unhealthy thoughts. No. Revenge fantasy to attack person, pessimism towards all of humanity, or self-loathing inferiority complex about oneself. Or maybe this person just caught in their own thoughts and they didn't notice me. It happens with us sometimes. We lost in our thoughts. So we might not be not entirely unaffected by it. Next time, and then we tell see what happens. So, basically, for each one of us, we can't change to, uh, to a large extent what happens in our outer world. We can't change how people will behave with us. But what happens to us doesn't affect us directly. Every experience that we have is a two-step process, not a one-step event. That means somebody snubs me and I feel upset. I might think that's just a one-step event. But it's not a one-step event. Somebody snubs me and then that is a physical stimulus and that gets into the mind and then it reveals something over there. And after that, something happens. I experience something. So, simple example to illustrate this. Say, suppose after this program there is food. Well, there is no suppose, food is there. <laughs> <laughs> so, now suppose there were a desert. Now, most of you are young. So, but suppose somebody had, somebody is here, they had. They loved a particular desert. And then, and here this, they came to know that. Okay, can anyone like to share what is their favorite desert? Anyone? Gulab <laughs> Jamun. Okay. <laughs> okay, Gulab Jamun is the Indian delicacy. Round, sweet balls. Super delicious. So, so now suppose somebody loves Gulab Jamun. And then they have just seen and they have heard that this is, that in this, uh, after this talk, there are going to be gulab jamuns. But just a few days before, so, so now they are longing, longing, longing for gulab jamuns. And then the menu is served, but there are no gulab jamuns. Hmm, what happened? They actually, you know, the cook made a mess of things, so they couldn't cook the gulab jamuns. But they will probably be disappointed. I suppose somebody else has just got, they also love love jamuns, but they have been diagnosed with diabetes. And they are thinking, everybody will be eating love jamuns and I won't be allowed, I can't eat. It will be a torture. <laughs> and then they, when their food is being served, they hear, there are no love jamuns. <laughs> <laughs> So what happened over here? The, the, the event is the same, but the experience is different. And then no gulab jamun is the same, but the experience is different. Because they are coming from a different context. So similarly, so any experience that we have, whether it is anger or it is loneliness or whether it is depression, frustration, grief, all these are not just due to the external things that have happened. Yes, the external things do matter, but it's a two-step process. The external event followed by the way 
it is processed in our mind. So if we are to if we are to be empowered internally, to be empowered internally, then we need to take charge of what is the processing that happens in cells and how could we change that. So I'll talk about this in four four a four part acronym with which I'll conclude this talk. It's called ACTS. A C T S. ACTS is so, so, what are we discussing? How can we change our thinking process so that we are not so negatively affected because of the events of life? How can we think in a more constructive way? Life determines our problems, but it is our mind that determines the size of those problems. Somebody stops me, that's just determined by life. But how do I take it? So, access A, C, T, S. A is first is analyze. Now, these don't necessarily have to be linear, whichever way it works. Analyze means, it's like, is this something which will pop it up on my inner screen? Is this something which I need to pay attention to? Not every notification needs to be noticed. So, imagine some, so imagine we're just going to a party, going to a party for a get together, and there somebody's now. Annoyed, insulted. But suppose you're going for an important say, job interview. And when you're going to meet a friend, you're not at them just now. You're not even paying much notice. Right? Because you have much more important things to do at that time. You have to focus on your job interview. So, analyze. Analyze means does this, is this just something which I want to pay attention to, or is this just something that's popular? But don't get carried away by thoughts. Analyze. One way to analyze is to articulate. So there is a voice inside our head which constantly keeps speaking. But if we speak the same thing, what happens? Speak is it. I am Nobody cares. Everybody walks. Now, the voice inside our head may say like that. But when we articulate Nobody cares. As soon as you start articulating, you have to think about it. And once you start thinking, hey, that's not true. There's so many people who care for me also. So many to value. Some people don't. So analyze means that we apply our intelligence to the thoughts that are popping up within us. Analyze. And as I said, these four steps are, you could say, synergistic. Next is, C is commit. Commit means that we need to have something to focus on. That, so suppose you are alone in a room with someone. And that is a person you just don't like at all. And you don't want to talk with him. Now, and you don't have any phone to distract yourself. <laughs> Now, if you are all alone in that room, and that person is, what are you going to do? Are you going to look at the roof? <laughs> Sooner or later, we will start talking with them. But suppose, there is somebody else in that room. And then, we start talking with that person. Then it's much easier to neglect this person, whom we don't want to talk with. The same applies in our inner conversation. It's almost impossible to not think of some thought. <laughs> okay, the thought has come up as a notification and I, I won't think about this. It's in the mental world, negative, not thinking is just not possible. It's very simple. Suppose I tell you, for the next 30 seconds, please don't think of a pink monkey. <laughs> Except for a pink monkey, you can think of whatever you want. <laughs> In your entire life, you may have never thought of a pink monkey. <laughs> How did it become pink? <laughs> did it fall into pink fate? It is genetically mutated. <laughs> so, we can't not think of things. 
So the first step ahead is and second is commit. Commit means that we need to have something worthwhile always to think about, something worthwhile to do. And then when we, we have notification, people treat me so poorly. If I say, I won't think about it, it won't work. But if I have something more constructive to do, and this comment also requires us, in a sense, to contemplate about what is important in our lives. So, basically, if, if we have something worth committing to, so each of us can find out things that we are attracted to and we are constructive. And it's like, suppose this is a circle of things you like to do. And this is a circle of things that are good for you. Hmm. And these two circles were identical, life would be so enjoyable. <laughs> <laughs> but these two circles don't have to be entirely non intersected They do intersect in some ways. You may like music. Now, there are different kinds of music, but there might be some music that is good for you. You might like to read, or you can read different things. You can just read some trash, or you can read something like that. So now find out something which is at the intersection of these two circles. What we like to do, and what is good for us. And committing to that becomes easy. So analyze and commit. So when we start overthinking, what happens is we don't analyze, we just get caught in the thought. But analyze, okay, this thought is not really worth thinking right now. Analyze, then commit. Then, what is the acronym we are discussing? Acts. So, T is tolerate. Tolerate means don't expect that the unwanted thought will go. Mm -hmm. Some, sometimes you have a notification, and some notifications come, you just click across and go on. Sometimes the notification is colored in such a way you can't find a cross anywhere. <laughs> where is it? Where is it? <laughs> so, some programs are very intrusive. So, just so this box. So, like that, sometimes we, the thought will still be there. So, tolerate means just because uh, we, just, suppose we tend to think negatively of things. Maybe we say, I'm a pessimistic thinker. Okay. Now, pessimism is always not bad. Not the optimism always good. Because pessimism, if it's habitual, then it's bad. But people who are pessimistic can also be cautious. They will not just uh, be impulsive about it. Optimism is good when you look at the positive kind of thing. But optimistic uh, people can also be utopian. They can be uh, polyadic, just unrealistic. So, I am a writer. So you say both this, you could say optimistic and pessimistic side are required. The optimistic side is where you creatively come up with many ideas to write. The pessimistic side is where well, this idea doesn't work. This is not written so well. So we need both. Not that pessimism is bad or optimism is good. But what is it? Habitually is focused on one side, is fixated on one way of thinking is bad. So tolerate means if you are if you're known to be pessimistic, then don't be worked up about it. Fix it. Yeah, my thoughts will actually go in a negative direction. I am a little risk averse. That's why there are ways in which people that people can grow in that way also. So don't expect that thought to go away. Tolerate this person. So that is again, if we stay committed, say like we are talking with one person and this other person we don't want to talk with. We keep talking and we look. The person is not gone away still. And we keep talking, and now people do, still not gone away. And we keep talking, and still not gone away. And then I say, what do you want? And as soon as we pay attention, that person captivates us. So, okay, let the person be there. In the world of thoughts, if in the world of, of, in the physical world, we could even have somebody evicted. But in the world of thoughts, we can't evict any thoughts. But, we can choose what attention we pay to them. So tolerate is very important. 
tolerance means to accept the presence without accepting the influence. If this is present to accept the presence. I can't resent or reject the presence. This is it. But without accepting the influence. And this is where for tolerating, it's important to remember that thoughts are powerless in and of themselves. Thoughts have no power. Will we give them power by giving them, by thinking about them? By giving them thought. So that is T. What are the, what are the acronym once again? S is the last part. S is spiritualize. Spiritualize is what? Spiritualize means that all of us have certain impressions in our mind. Each of us has some data in our phone. So whatever I search, it will different path, objects will come up depending on what is on my phone. So similarly, now spiritualize means that we expose ourselves to spiritual stimuli and these form spiritual impressions in us. Say for example, we did Kirtan before this. It's musical meditation. Oh, there are different forms of meditation. There is reading spiritual wisdom texts. Coming in the social of spiritual people. All these will create spiritual impressions in us. And when we spiritualize our consciousness, say by daily practice of meditation, by regular reading of wisdom texts, but periodically coming in the association of spiritual people, by that, the impressions in the mind will change. And not only the impressions in the mind will change, when you spiritualize, two things happen. What is the impression in the mind, they, they change. And secondly, we are repeatedly reminded that I am the spiritual consciousness. I am not my mind. I am not my thoughts. So spirituality makes us more self-aware. So when we become more self-aware, it is like we rise above our thoughts. We rise above our situations and we rise above our emotions. We spiritualize, and the thoughts may come, but we can see, okay, this thought is coming, let it come, let it go. Spiritualizing is, is more of transforming. Spiritualizing is when we transform our inner world by changing the impressions of it. And when we do this, then we find that we will be able to tap our inner power of thinking much more of and each one of us can, by choosing our thoughts more carefully, we can do much, much more in our lives. Our thoughts get dissipated in hundreds of things. If our thoughts can be more organized, each one of us can do, tap our ability more and more and make a better and better contribution to the world. So our spirituality increases our ability to tap our ability. Each of us has certain abilities. But when we are distracted, when our thoughts are going haywire, you may be good at singing, you may be good at sports, you may be good at math, whatever you're good at. When your thoughts are distracted, you won't be able to make good use of whatever you're good at. Sometimes you may not even be able to discover, realize what you are good at because we are so, so distracted. But our spirituality, it will increase our ability to tap our ability. And in that way, we can all become better human beings and make better contributions in our work. So I'll summarize what I spoke today, and then we can have a few questions. So I spoke on the topic of thinking about thinking. I said, what is thinking? So we talked about two understandings of the word thought. I got a thought, and I have given this lot of thought. In terms of the three level metaphor, the body, mind, consciousness, like the hardware, software, and user. So, thinking happens at the level of the software. If you consider a phone, not many notifications come up. That is, I got a thought. Which notification we need and we give due attention? That is, I have given this lot of thought. So, when we start overthinking, that means some notification pops up and we get lost in that. And then I talked about. For us to think, think about thinking, that means we understand our thoughts are intrinsically powerless. They are just 
these are the streams of images or streams of string or streams of sound that come within us. When we focus on them, they gain power. And then we did the thought experiment about how this inner screen, inner, inner seer, inner screen, and outer scene. Inner seer is the consciousness, inner screen is the mind, and outer scene is the uh, is the physical reality. So we may our thoughts are often a unpredictable combination of the physical stimuli and the mental impressions. We discussed it just now, but each of us react differently. So our experiences are not a one step happening. They are a two step. The external event and how it is processed by our mind. And we discuss how we can change the way we process what happens to us in life. And for that I discussed the acronym. What was it? Acts. So A was analyze. Means when a thought pops up, is this a notification that needs to be noticed? So one way to do it is to articulate it. Just speak it softly to yourself. That will trigger the thinking. Then C was commit. Means say, A, if we don't want to talk with someone, it's very difficult unless we have someone else to talk. Similarly, in the thought world, we can't not think about thought. So if we have certain values and purposes important for ourselves, something like at the intersection of things that are we like and things that are good for us, then we can commit to that. Then B is tolerate. tolerate. That we can't eliminate thoughts from our we can't evict thoughts from our inner world, but we can, we need to accept. They will be there, but they don't need to be given attention. And like S was spiritualized. Spiritualized means that we change the impressions within our inner world by exposing ourselves to spiritual stimuli and by increasing our awareness that we are spiritual beings different from our mind. And then we, when we thus act, apply acts in our life, we'll find that we can increase our ability to tap our ability through our spirituality and thus become more empowered to grow and contribute as human beings during our life journey. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. So, any questions or comments? You are still thinking? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. So some thoughts become overpowering. How does that happen? You could say every thought is like a snowball. I had gone to Calgary, as an university Calgary, on top of a hill. So we actually saw how snowballs had formed. So at the top, it is just a tiny snow pebble. It's not even a ball. And somebody could just flick it with their toe, it will break, break apart. As it keeps coming down, 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 it starts gaining mass and momentum. It becomes a snowball. By the bottom of the hill, it can be a snow boulder. And the same person who could have knocked it off with a toe, they may be knocked over her toe. Yeah. Similarly, for all of us, at the initial level, it's just a snow pebble. It's one notification. Okay. So we all periodically get what you could say a uh, snack attack a desire to have a snack we are attacked by <laughs> we are attacked by a desire for a snack say a snack attack mm. when we get that at that time it's just one desire but if we give in to it we might eat one thing two things three things four things and then we might just go into a eating binge and then we get frustrated why did I do that so what happens over there is it starts as a small pebble. Now, now we know that different hills can be of different slopes, inclinations. Some hills might be a gentle slope. Some hills might be a rapid slope. So that inclination is determined by our habits. 
the stronger a habit, the sharper is the fall. That means if somebody is say doesn't have much of a habit, if somebody say is told in the corner and maybe you're seeing somebody smoking marijuana or taking taking some drugs or whatever. Uh, maybe you take once, uh, I don't want to take it, I don't want to get into this. It's dry once. So it's almost at that time there's no inclusion. So it's almost like a flat surface. It's only when somebody pushes you, you take it. So it has to roll down very gently. But suppose somebody is an addict. Addict to me is basically there is very little distance between impulse and reaction. The thought comes up and immediately the act acts on the thought. So it's like the floor has become dull. It's like the inclination has become a steep cliff. So as soon as something comes, it falls. So for all of us, depending on the kind of habits we have cultivated, certain things we will do very effortlessly. And they can be good things as well as bad things. And certain things may require some effort. So, for us, we all can look at what is it that we do impulsively, which we shouldn't be doing. And if the slope has already become very, very sharp, then we need to do one thing absolutely to protect ourselves. That is, create a fence. Create a fence around the top. Now, somebody whose slope is very gentle, they may not need a fence. Suppose somebody is an alcoholic and they want to recover from their alcohol. And their home is on top of a bar. <laughs> However much determination you have, it's, it's, we can all be determined, but we can't have the same level of determination 24 hours a day. Sometimes an impulse will come. And if the opportunity to indulge is readily available, it will succumb. So what we need is, Create a distance, create a fence. I used to use the word wall, but now the word wall has got a different connotation in America. <laughs> so <laughs> I use the word fence, not a wall. <laughs> but we need that. So once we create that, then we can protect ourselves. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Yes, please. Um, Mindfulness, there are many different uh, traditions, different schools of thought. Most of them, my mindfulness basically focuses on becoming more aware of our situations and our emotions. So, our physical reality and our mental reality, what's going on over there. But we focus, or we also focus on what, what are we as conscious beings. So, if you understand that, then it becomes a more holistic understanding. But mindfulness is a very powerful tool in and of itself. In mindfulness, often that last part, the ACT could be common. But spiritualize, often that's not so talking about. So how I, I like to put it is that if somebody is sick and they're in pain, then a good physician would give them both analgesics and antiseptics. Something to deal with the pain and then something to cure. If you only give pain medication, it appears that the pain has gone away, but it's been only been covered, not cured, it'll come back. So we need, 
the antiseptic also for curing. So similarly, there are many ways in which we can calm our mind. And mindfulness can be very powerful calming our mind. But in many ways, it's like an analysis, like a pain medication. Unless we change, change the impressions in our mind through spirituality, spirituality with antiseptic. So if we combine both together, mindfulness helps us to, when the un, unruly thoughts, emotions, desires pop up, we can use mindfulness to distance ourselves from that. So there is pacification of the mind and there is purification of the mind. So what mindfulness can do easily and effectively is pacification. But purification will happen when we expose ourselves to purer things. And the spiritual reality is the ultimately pure reality. So mindfulness is uh, mindfulness combined with spirituality can be a very powerful package for self transformation. Okay. Thank you. Yes. When you were addressing the next question about the various levels of understanding of fairness and the high intervention or the way that affects, obviously we want to like be fearful and make sure that we're like we living right on top of a bar and mm. distancing yourself from the samurai itself, but if it's something that isn't you can't build a fence. So what's the better way? Avoidance is not the best. Yeah, avoidance is the first step. But it's often an essential first step. Let's take another example of the same thing. Like the, instead of a incline on a, from a hill down, if we consider a room. So the room floor is inclined this way. And you have some maybe electronic equipment, which is not waterproof. And say water spins over. And it goes and damages the electronic equipment. We don't want the water to go over there. So what do we do? Hey, water, don't go there. It's not going to help. So just don't think like this. It's not a very helpful. Okay, that's it. That's how do you use strategy for going about? So broadly, you do three things. First is restriction. Build something around it in that direction. Maybe a small wall, or something by which you stop protect the equipment. Then there is redirection. You have a mop, have some cloth, have some brush, which will push the water in the other direction. And the third is reconstruction. Reconstruct the flow so that it's inclined this way. So that the water will not go here, it will go here when you want it to. So similarly, restriction is the first step. So we need some kind of fence so that the impulses when they come up, for all of us, we have various urges. Maybe the urge to overeat, the urge to over spend too much time on social media, the urge to do the on internet, the urge, so many urges here. The urge to gossip. Now these urges, they have surges. <laughs> that means we all may have certain we may have anger, we may have greed, we may have sensual desires, various sensual desires. So these are at a particular level and sometimes they shoot up. Now, when they shoot up, if at that time the opportunity to indulge is very easily available, we will suck up. So, we need a fence. Fence, that is a, you could say the first level of defense. Then, what I talked about, finding the, what we commit ourselves to. Finding something which is at the intersection of what we like and what is good for us. That will become our tool for redirection. When the thoughts are going in that direction, I don't want them to go there. So, say we are they are hooked to something, addicted to something. Okay, I need something else to think about. How do I push my thoughts in another direction? That can be our tool for redirection. And then spirituality is the tool by which the reconstruction happens. As we practice spirituality, as we start practicing, say, mantra meditation or bhakti yoga, and we find that our inner desires are transforming. That uh, the in what we naturally think about will itself change. So that's some reconstruction, 
sorry, restriction, read direction is equal to Does it make sense? Thank you. Yes, sir. Your question How can we decide what is worth focusing on? The, one of the best ways to deal with the mind is to not say yes and not say no, but to say wait. <laughs> well, it's simple, let's say the notification. Say, suppose a friend sends you a video. Now, should you watch the video? Should not watch the video? Maybe it's 10 15 minutes, maybe it's one hour. Now, how do you decide that? Usually, what happens is we are always looking for newness. And the natural urge is if something new comes up, let's watch it. Let's get into it. So, now it could be that what the video they have sent is useful. It could be that it's of no use. We don't know in advance. So, and at that time, in the heat of the moment, it is very difficult to decide. So, at that time, the best policy is defer it. Okay, maybe tonight. Not now, tonight I'll do it. Or tomorrow I'll do it. Keep a maybe 24 hour gap. What will happen by that? See, the, the, the idea of newness that goes away, maybe it's not so important. Recently, I changed my laptop. And I imported my bookmarks from Google. And I look at the, I don't know, like a list of several hundred articles that I, at bookmarks I want to read. And I look at them, why, why do I want to read them? <laughs> <laughs> it didn't seem interesting at all. But maybe something came up in a feed somewhere. And let me read it. So what happens? At that time, it's almost impossible to process. So don't even try. For Unless it's like a very urgent thing. And then we just go by the year. Just do it and see what happens. But usually, best thing is to defer. The Bhagavad Gita talks about a concept called the modes. Modes are basically subtle forces which shape the way we interact with the world. So generally, uh, so you could say that these modes, you can call it reflective, impulsive, passive. So usually, when we are run, when we are doing our things in the world, we are in the impulsive world. We are doing in the heat of action. Do this, do this, do this, do this. So when we are impulsive, it is very difficult to reflect. And that's why this kind of decision is very difficult to do at that time. So just defer it. And then generally in the early morning hours, we, may, we are usually more reflective. So and then when we are tired, we are just passive. So when we are impulsive or passive, uh, at that time, it's very difficult to decide what to pay attention to. So better have something to do and focus on that. And when you are reflective, maybe later in the day or later next morning, or whatever, think about it. When you need to focus on it, then it's much more, much easier to decide. Does that make sense? Thank you. Oh, yes, please. Yeah, please. of my dreams and it's my understanding that my dreams are the product of my mind. And in my dreams I enjoy other people to who I hear, you know, I can talk to them and interact with them. And how is it possible that my mind, you know, like a machine, can create people that are alive and that I can interact with? And it feels so real. Almost feels as real as you talking to you and to anybody here almost like this is also a product of the mind, of the being, as well. There is almost no difference between the people I talk with and interact in my dreams and the people I interact here. Like there is almost no difference. Yeah. Okay. So, um, is this a dream? Is this a product of mind? Okay, good question. Is it Lakshmi take this question? Last question? Yeah. Okay. So, sometimes we have dreams which are so vivid 
if it actually I'm interacting with people. So is this also so it seems as real as a physical reality? So is our physical reality also a product of the mind? Is it also like a dream? And there are three levels of reality. There is, as I said, consciousness, which is spiritual reality. There is the mind, which is the mental reality, and there's the body and matter, which is the physical reality. So now all these three are real. And the physical reality is not solely a product of the mind. Our experience of physical reality is a product of the mind. Mm -hmm. But physical reality itself exists. If I say everything is just in the mind, and I try to walk through the wall, bang! Well, the pain I feel is also a product of my mind. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a real experience. And I probably will have a real physical swelling on my head after this. <laughs> so, the physical reality is also real. You could take it this way, right? So, the mental reality is also real. The physical reality is also real. The difference is that we are different from both of them. Instead of saying that either of them is not real, so are our dreams real? Well, how do you exactly define it? For us, it's a real experience. Sometimes we may imagine we are being chased by a tiger and we wake up panting and heaving. So what we saw in the level of the dream had physical effects for us. That means it's not that simple. So the idea is that we are conscious beings who are experiencers of both the mental reality and the physical reality. And this is a big subject, I'll just mention briefly that we are all as conscious beings, we are souls. And the soul is on a multi life journey of spiritual evolution. And the soul, in each life, the kind of actions that it does, it is that they are called karma. And the kind of actions the soul has done in the past determines the situations that they face in the present. Now, some of us may be born in a wealthy, loving, comfortable family society. Some of us may be born in a much more difficult place. Now, why the difference? It's just the, the differences at the physical level are based on what the soul has done in the past. So, similarly, now, just as there are differences at the physical level for all of us, similarly, there are differences at the mental level. I was in, I was in New Zealand and one person came to me and he said, I have great fear. So many people talk about fear and how to deal with fear. I tried to use my advice. They said, I have great fear of sleeping. I said, really? Why? He said, as soon as I sleep, I start getting nightmares. So now it's, it's sleep is when you want to rest and relax. But you start getting nightmares each time. It's very, very painful. So what has happened over here is, each of us has to neutralize some karma we have got from the past. And sometimes we may go through physically painful situations. Sometimes we may go through mentally painful situations. And say some people may have very vivid painful dreams. Some people may have vivid joyful dreams. So, sometimes we say, oh, it was like a dream. That means it was so wonderful. But actually not all dreams are wonderful. And even in our dreams, we are not always complete controllers. In our dreams also, some of our dreams are just observers. Some of our dreams, we are participators. But if none of our dreams are in the soul controllers, now how other people behave, what other people, we don't control that always. So the idea is that, just as in physical reality, we can't control our situations. But we can control our response to them. The same is the fresh of the mind also. Some of us have more real dreams, which we more vivid dreams which you remember. Some of us have may have dreams you don't remember. Some of us have dreams which are negative. Some of us have dreams which are positive. So the idea in this is, is tolerate. So whether it is real or unreal, or how the degree of reality that we experience with it. With respect to dreams, we don't have much control. It's just tolerated. So for somebody who has very vivid, painful dreams. So I suggested to him that he can have spiritual music going on constantly. We just have a phone with spiritual music going on next to him. And he found that quite helpful. 
uh, one of the names of the divine in the Bhakti Yoga tradition is the Swapna Nashana. One, the divine is the destroyer of bad dreams. So, <laughs> so if you invoke the presence of the divine through some sacred music, then that can help us to also deal with dreams. Okay, deal with unwanted dreams. So thank you very much for your attention and participation. Hare Krishna. A nice transition of the power of state.